Blood Brothers Podcast of the Five Pillars Production. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and foes, and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Dili Hussein. Um, so uh, before I introduce today's esteemed guest, it's important that you all know that you've probably recognised this background, this setting. It's not my usual abode for this podcast. It is the studio of the very well-known and comedic, uh, funny at times, annoying at most, but loving always, Zishan Smal Tijanna. We're currently... Have the great honour and pleasure in filming in his studio So if anyone's disrupting the podcast You see me randomly cracking up with the guests No, there's only one person to blame And we know he's a master disruptor But that's enough of uh, the person on the side man Today we have <laughs> You like that one? The side man Straight away Today we have a brother who joined us in episode 2 of the Blood Brothers podcast Nearly 2 years ago And even that podcast was incomplete to some regard, there's lots to talk about. There's a lot of unfinished and incomplete conversations. Um, that is the debater, the YouTuber, right. the esteemed, firing, okay. academic, author, oh, the Ummah's big, friendly, but fearless giant, oh. Muhammad Hijaz. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Doing okay. <laughs> uh, was, that, was, that, was that a big enough that, intro? That's, I think that, you know, it will do. The Ummah's <laughs> favourite big friendly giant That's fine man. That's Big fine. friendly but fearless giant There's no doubt about that yo. Okay <laughs> No doubt about that Yeah calm, calm down Calm down <laughs> Zishan can you Can, we, can you behave uh, Please I'll try, I'll try. Okay Teek How's going on Alhamdulillah How you doing bro Alhamdulillah my dear brother How's Ramadan I yeah, was okay It was good Alhamdulillah Well gone with the video Showing your Your pecs and that And that, the whole wrestling flex that, that was not my idea okay. Honestly well, Obviously like you know We have a you know who the guy is anyways yeah, yeah. He told us what to do And I just did it How did you feel about it? A bit uncomfortable But you know yeah, But there was a video before With you and Sheikh Haytham I think we're in Norway Or something about Why does Muhammad Hijab Show his muscles Or something like that So it was a conversation That's already been had It's not like I had a fantastic uh, Frame at that particular time Anyway It's just anything to catch The attention of the, Okay Of the and, you know, and your nipple and I've, your gained, I've gained weight uh, recently I'm 120 kilograms now It's 265 pounds of pure muscle mass Pure muscle mass, <laughs> yeah No fat whatsoever, yeah <laughs> Single digit, uh, okay. you know uh, But look, let's put, let's, let's put That was my second favourite video My favourite video It was actually, believe it or not, Ramadan Was the one about my life The story mm. Which you did It was very interesting Very touching, my brother mm. um, but An aspect of it uh, stood out And I want to talk about it a little bit You said you were raised by a single mother mm. Um, was was that the case from the very beginning? Uh, when, when, when was dad not around from the very beginning? No, probably another about seven or eight years old. I remember that. You know, it's not that dad wasn't around. He was he was around. You know, he wasn't an absent father in okay. that sense. Like I've always had a relationship with my father. Obviously, you know, it wasn't a conventional setting where you had like a nuclear family and all that kind of thing. And despite the fact that maybe I didn't get as much exposure to my father that many other people would have gone to their fathers, maybe, you know, I still was able to pick up a lot from him, actually, uh, growing up. You know, uh, one of the things that he he's into um, is uh, he's into like he he, he done his degree in uh, Manchester University, you know, he's gone to the level of a professor, you know, he started his business and. He, he's also someone who's kind of likes the academic route. In addition, he's, like, his sense of humor is quite similar to mine. Um, when you meet him one day, you'll find out what I'm talking about. But despite the fact that we, I haven't had that much exposure, so it's, I don't know, is it something inherited? But uh, there's lots of things that you know I've picked up from him. And um, obviously my mum was the one who was, you know, had the lion's share of responsibility when I was a child. And in this country, as you know, you know, the council moves you from flat to flat. So we had, we had quite a tough um, upbringing in that sense because I was moving from flat to flat. Um, like it was called temporary accommodation. Can I just briefly, so you know when dad was around, I'm assuming it was as a result of a divorce? Yes, yes, yes. So was there any kind of resentment towards your dad? No, not necessarily. I mean, at that age, I, these themes were a little bit um, above my pay grade. Like I didn't know like, 
Is the pay grade good at the moment? Uh, no, I mean, I understand things more now. What I meant is I didn't understand things back then. So maybe you don't understand analogies. That's why I'm, you know, have to, I have to scaffold this kind of conversation with this guy. more simple language. This guy. <laughs> this guy just took an uppercut, upper, uppercut from nowhere, but yalla, come carry on. <laughs> I'm joking. So, no, I mean, not with my dad, is, um, sorry, with my mum, uh, it was me. Uh, I got two sisters. So uh, one of my sisters is just um, moving around. Me, mum, and my sister moving around from kind of place to place, from accommodation to accommodation, from school to school. So that was disrupting. It was a bit. It, you, I can imagine. I can. I can remember. Sorry, I can remember being in maybe five or six different primary schools. Wow. Yeah, like we moved from West London to Central London to North West London to you know, I think at one point even South London. The only place we didn't really live in is East London. Um, you say you, you say that with a big smile on your face. Why? <laughs> no, that's where the Muslim population is. That but is. I, we went everywhere else yeah. except for that yeah. place. Um, so yeah, just keep moving, moving house, moving place, moving school and getting used to a new environment. And in a sense, it probably developed me in a, in a positive way, but it was a bit destabilizing, I have to say, you know, but throughout that whole period, it was very difficult for my, for us as a family. But, you know, my mum did handle that, like, you know, do as much as she could do. But, but, but as you were growing up, as you said, it wasn't, it was above your pay grade. When you started nearing the pay grade and you started making sense of the family setup. Uh, dad not being around as a result of a divorce, obviously having a relationship, was there no resentment then? Or a feeling of things could have been easier, would have been easier, would have been different, could have been different? I think there was a feeling of that in my early teens. And, uh, you know, there could have been and there would have been and all that kind of thing. But then, to be honest, like, as I grew a little bit older, and especially as religion came into my life, and I think this was a pivotal turning point in my mid-teens somewhere when I started to become more and more religious. I started to just think about things in terms of rights and obligations. So even though, you know, I didn't get that kind of nuclear family upbringing or whatever, I just thought to myself, the Quran tells me to be good to both of my parents and they've, and they both done really big things for me growing up mm -hmm. and in, they've contributed in their own way. And so all I'm going to be doing is try and re repay them with respect and honor. Okay, so let's let's stay on the theme of 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 fatherhood mm. uh having an authoritative male figure in the family one which you conventionally did not enjoy or have um many sociologists um have said that one of the reasons why young men uh, teens gravitate towards gangs is because they don't have a father figure around they're looking for uh, a patriarch a male figure i don't like the term patriarch but they're looking for a male figure someone who will teach them discipline a code of conduct good or bad irrespective you need a gravitation towards that was that your mum in your life i believe so I, I, the thing is that one of the things that i feel really helps a young boy coming up a young male coming up was uh, a lot of love coming from my mum Like me personally That's how I Like because that gives me confidence And the outside world The fact that if you're given a lot of love and attention Which I did receive You know That you're, you'll be more likely to be confident on the outside Because you feel like Okay well You know uh, that There is a comfort There is a I'm loved safe at haven I'm loved at home So I'm yeah. okay outside kind of Yeah thing. And, and so I think that really contributed From that angle Like you know Um also the fact that, I mean, I've got an extended family. And when I go to Egypt, and I've been to Egypt many, many times, I've actually spent many years there uh, in Egypt. Um, did your mom discipline you? Did you ever have to did, be disciplined? Yeah. Not in a physical way, to be honest. Okay. She, didn't, she didn't have the philosophy of hit, hitting. Yeah, she didn't actually have that philosophy. Um, she was a very strong woman, but she was a very affectionate woman. So she... I, I believe I had, you know, I, I inherited both of those characteristics. In many ways, she probably had the biggest influence on in my life because I, you know, I've, I've taken that on board. I'm, I'm, and she believed in rights. You know, I, we were talking before the podcast about taking court cases and stuff like that. My mm. dad and my mom, both of them believed in, okay, what are my rights in this country? And there was one particular court case that both of them done uh, in the House of Lords at that time. And they were doing it without representation. Okay. Can uh, we say the name? Was, it's a very unique name, isn't it? Oh, Shamash. Yeah. Shamash. Is it Sean? 
this is. I think you got shot mashed. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Honestly, and uh, it was it was in that because now it's called the Supreme Court of Justice, right? But before it used to be called the House of Lords, and the ho- obviously the House of Lords used to be a court as yeah, well as a second cha- second chamber of Parliament, and so on. Um, second House of uh, of of, Pol- uh, of the um, what do you call it? The legislature. But having said that, you know they they went there. And they won the case, and it was very. Uh, well, at least they represented themselves. And I saw from that as like, wow, you guys are preparing this. I was very young at that time, maybe seven or six, something like that. And then they keep telling me the story afterwards. But that theme persisted. So that the the, the, the a theme of know what your rights are mm-hmm. really well, and make sure you get those rights. And so, um, as a single mum, my mum had to continue doing that, you know, because obviously we were kind of grinding and hustling. And so that came into the, uh, in my mind, like, you know, let's see what opportunities we have. Education became a big thing in the house, a, a culture in the household, huge thing. Because both of my parents, obviously, they, were, they have degrees, they've, they've completed university. Uh, in the case of my dad, he went all the way through the academic route, and he went to the university in this country as well. Uh, <coughs> so, you know, and he's a professor and so on. So the, uh, education was a big culture in the house. And I believe that if education is a big culture, in the household, then it can create, it, it, will dist- it will distract a child from gang life, these kinds of things. I think that's one of the main things that prevented me from going into to these kind of uh, dark uh, paths. You okay. know? So given that you're saying that you stayed away from, you stayed away from that path or, or a path of which could have led to you in more undesirable situations, right? And because education, love from your mom, Kept it going, kept yeah. you focused, yeah. So and, as and, and religion as well. I of mean, course, of course. In my mid-teens, a lot of the things that people were doing were haram. Like, so I wasn't getting involved in in that because of the religion. Were you ever tempted? No, uh, you, you, with certain things, I was actually never tempted. Drugs? I was never tempted with drugs. Weed? Never ever. And like you know, I'm not saying this to, you, but genuinely, like I would think of it and think, what what, what on earth? What these guys doing I'm not interested Like I was not even Tempted with it Is that because the medication You're on these days Is much stronger <laughs> yeah, Now I'm on Stronger medication We'll get to the medication <laughs> bit in it. Um, but Girls No but honestly yeah. Girls No I was protected from that Massively Never had moments of thirst um, No I definitely had Moments of thirst But you know I believe that For the most part For the most part Especially in secondary school And everyone who's Gone to secondary school With me would Testify to this Actually <laughs> as, a, as a young man I was I was when I, when I understood the rules in Islam, I was in my mid-teens, I understood, okay, this is what I can't be doing, right? Uh, so girlfriend-boyfriend relationship is not allowed. Uh, drinking is not allowed. Didn't entertain it? I didn't entertain it. Female friends? I had, yeah, we had female friends. Everyone had female Like we had, well, I went to a mixed school. Zishan didn't have female friends, they only had male friends. Oh, it's different. For, for me, growing up, yeah. but but I didn't have female friends that I would go and meet He got smashed. Like when I went to school, we used to have, everyone used to be friends with everyone. It was a mixed school. Okay. So that's not something I can change, like, you know. Would you say your mum, may Allah bless her and give her a long life, I mean, do you think she managed you well? Because ultimately bringing up children that in the absence of a father, um, it requires managing your children. It's managing yeah, them yeah, through yeah. the... Was, there were times where I think it was difficult for her. Yeah. Like when I was in year nine, I think that was probably year 10, 11. Like, but then I think, yeah, I think as soon as I start, especially when I started to get older, mm. I started to... I started to develop a plan for myself and I started to know, okay, I, what, this is what I want to achieve when I get older. Mm. When I started to do that, like, okay, these are my objectives. So life became, I think, easier for her because I had clear direction, objectives, a plan, schedule, time management. And she always stressed that to me. She goes, look, if you want to be successful in life, you have to be, you have to be able to time management. She said life is all about time management. You know what I mean? So, you know, literally now, um, when I used to be in, not even now, like when I used to be in GCSEs, year 10, 11, she'd say, look at, you know, how many hours you're doing to this subject. This like, she would. What did you get for GCSEs, just out of curiosity? GCSEs, I got, I didn't get any Cs. I got, I think, all A's and B's. What's wrong uh, Yeah, A star, A's, B. Like, the minimum grade was a B. And what did you, what did you do in A levels? A's. What did you, what did you study in A levels? Um, that's actually, there was a, there was a, a transition point from, from GCSEs to A levels, <laughs> and when I went to A levels, I done like four or five A levels. By the okay. way, interesting. So I done uh, politics, I done uh, psychology, I done because um, what it is is that in the first year you have to do ASs and then you have to do ASs and then yeah. this. 
English literature, uh, economics, and I did an AS in philosophy as well, and Arabic. I think Brilliant. that's six. Yeah. Would you say you're an easy person to manage? I ask this because obviously. You know, I no. I did some of my A levels after I finished year thirteen. Look, I so what, as, 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 as when I was senior, when I was doing uni, okay. I decided to go back and do some more A levels. The question of management is a unique question, and it's more relating to recent activities, uh, and, and yourself as as, as a dai and someone who sometimes gets involved in certain. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Six A levels. See, that's six A levels. By the way, why would I go this green? <laughs> it's a big jump and I jumped 10 years. Yeah. If you don't allow me to get this, Zishan. That's 12 years. Huh? 12 years. Yeah. Zishan, shut up, man. Well, look, on the issue, so, so you've done your A-levels. Tell me about the moment you got into Dawa. From a public... I was doing my... Oh, oh look. Uh, I was doing Dawa since I was in year 12. Okay, so I, with my friends in school, we used to debate religion. That was... It wasn't the all we did. Obviously, we talk about other things. We used to have cussing matches. We used to go into the, and I used to be quite good at it actually. Yeah, well, cussing. Say, like, yeah, cussing people like, and that actually got funny enough, and ironically enough, it actually became part of the dawah. Okay. <laughs> Do you think <laughs> you that's know? a good thing? I don't know. Sometimes, yeah. Okay. It depends on who I'm going against. You know, we just so we used to have cussing matches. You stand next to somebody in the in the in the in the, in the, in the playground, and you cuss each other until like people are laughing and it's like this kind Someone of thing. Someone gives up. Someone gives up or things like that. Sometimes he used to do it in rapping format. Tell me more about debating religion in We used to talk about it. I used to talk about religion to my friends, my cl uh, close friends and stuff like that. I just used to stop the... I used to drive on R17, so I used to stop the car. I used to have like a little book and whatever, and I used to go through that book. Which book do you remember? What book? I do remember the book. I, I, for example, there was a small Sira book I went through with them. I think I completed it. Well, I can't remember the name of you it. Told me this it wasn't we, uh, you, to, you, you told me this when we were travelling. You said you used to go for drives with non-practicing friends or non-Muslim friends and basically give them dawah during the road trip. That's right. Uh, yeah, that, that's just part of my personality. It's like everyone who knows me would know that that's part of what I believe in and stuff. Do you remember when you were going to play the A to Z game in Abu Dhabi and you made us do Tajweed on Quran? But then we found out it's because you were very crap at the A to Z game. Do you remember? And you were also a sore loser. Do you remember the A to Z game? I think so, yeah. You have to think of a country, a town, a city, or a continent that starts with a particular letter. Oh, yes. You were terrible at the game. Yeah, I'm not the best geographer. If I did a geographer A level, okay. <laughs> and that was something I was considering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, what was I going to say? It was okay, so now I'm talking about more public scene. Mm. When did hijab come into the public? Um. Public eye. I done a de like not religious debate, but I done a debate in school. We had this thing where you like whoever wins will become the prime minister of the school. Okay. And and all the school years, like from seven to eleven, would vote for the winner. Yeah. So we had like these debates and stuff like that. And I wasn't here at all for you know, and I won that. And I remember what happened. I went outside, and my my head teacher was talking to me. She was like, "You were using a lot of rhetoric and stuff like that." Why? Well, and there was another guy who was going against me. He was using a lot of fact, like. He built it up with all facts, and he was good as well. I said to her something. I said to her something that I look back now and I smile when I think about it. I said, "Miss, don't you know how this game works?" <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said to her, "Do you think they understand half of what he's saying?" I said, uh, "I said they only understand." I said, "These people only understand the language of humiliation." <laughs> <laughs> she said that to a teacher. Yeah, I said, and then she looked at me and she's like, "I think she kind of agreed with it, but yeah. she didn't like what I was saying." But then I went back inside and I started talking about. You know the guy, his physical appearance, and this and that. And then I mentioned four or five facts, and I realized that there was a balance. If I wanted to be a debater, I have to. Inter I have to be an entertainer. Like I know it's you can call it whatever you want to call it, but this is a show. And I realized from that age, I was seventeen at that time, and I had a lot of practice. Uh, uh, people don't realize that. You know, David Wood. I don't come out and just debate David Wood in two thousand eighteen. Yeah. I had a lot of practice, and it was practice in front of public audiences. I tried different techniques. When I went to university, in the first year of university or something like that, they had someone, um, gonna, you were asking me about um, when I started to become public on my DAO, they had someone debating a Christian, the Islamic society. I think this was the second year of my university, actually, yeah? And then the guy couldn't come. It was a sheikh. And then they said, who would do it? I said, look, I think I'll do well. When I went there, they were very happy in it. Because <laughs> I, I just done really well in it. And I was like, everyone was talking about it and clamoring and, you know, 
after the on the on the train and having a discussion about it, and I thought this is this is something I know I'm good at. Okay. Like I've discovered what I'm good like I've discovered my talent at the age of 17, 18, 19. I discovered I'm very good at entertaining people. I'm very good at public speaking. So I realized that you know this is something I can carry forward and obviously knowing that I've got a religious remit and I believe in Islam and I believe in spreading it. So this is what I'm going to do to contribute to the Ummah. So during that journey and as your name started becoming more apparent, speakers corner and so forth, obviously you started accumulating views and subscribers and the name started going up. <clears throat> and of course, your height, your general physique obviously goes, okay, don't get too excited, but I'm just saying that it's commonly associated with your character, yes. right? Uh, but surely you've had some pitfalls in the way, like regrets, things you could have done better, things you shouldn't have done. You had any of those? What are you talking about in public debates? Public debates, public engagement, speakers' corner. Public debates. debates. I look back and I actually think I've got I've, like okay, there there are mistakes I've made, like some wording that I've got wrong or some definitions that I've got wrong but the fact that you know a lot of people would mention those I think that that shows that on in general they went all right okay if I were to go back and you say okay well would you do the David Wood debate again I'd say by and large no because it could have gone worse than it would <laughs> I mean it's gone much better than mm. what people would anticipate would you go back and do the atheist debate again no I'm happy with I'm happy with the results of those okay. debates and I, and I know that anyone I debate is not happy with those results because everyone I debate spends hours and hours trying to justify to the audiences why they think they won. I don't do that. Mm. Like that's that's a trend. All of my debating partners have spent, even if it's an one year later, because of the constant, like it's they've been told over and over again, you've lost this debate. Yeah, and so they have, they have to come out and make. So I'm alhamdulillah, I believe that you know, in terms of the public debates I've done so far, I'm pretty. Happy with the performances Okay, let's put debates aside Let's talk about YouTube antics YouTube YouTube And yeah. certain engagements that we've had I mean, you were here in May 2019 A lot's happened in two years, Hijab Let's start off with, let's say Without going into detail What I guess I'm talking about Let's say the, the Yasir Qadi episode mm. uh, About the Quran and, and so forth Which you then had to subsequently cut a bit out of Right? Is that something you would have done? Could you rewind time? Yeah. Uh, uh, the thing is with the Asakari issue. Was it a setup? Well, because that's one of the things I was doing. We the were rounds. setting him up. Yeah. No. Okay. I told him. I mean, I didn't tell him what I was going to ask him, right? But the, th the thing is, it was basically going to be based on because the day before it, I was on a community page. I'm, I told the people on the community page that I'm going to speak to Asakari and what, uh, what question should I ask him. Mm. And the ones with the most likes, like the top five I looked at in my community page, I said, okay, no problem. I wrote them down and I asked them the questions that people wanted me to ask. So I was looking at it from that perspective. I'm only responsible for the question. I'm not responsible for the answer. Now, the thing is, would I put it up now, having no, that it will be twisted and turned in the way it has been by these antagonizers and detractors? No, I wouldn't. Do you think Sheikh Yasser could have answered the question better? Yeah, definitely. No doubt about it, yeah. But you just said that, look, I can only be blamed or I can only be held responsible for the question that was asked. Mm. You you could be held responsible for even raising the issue, period. Yeah. Did you, yeah. Did, you, did you feel the timing of it was appropriate? I don't know about the timing, but I, I do feel like asking that particular question would, if, if there was a controversy around it, well, once again, I, I wasn't aware that you know, that Yasser Qadi had particular views on, on these issues. So I was coming from kind of like an ignorant perspective. I was ignorant. Were you not aware of the dramas that took place? No, I was aware of that. The leaks and all that. I was aware of that. But I wanted, in a sense, I wanted him to clarify that. And in a way that was very clear cut and whatever. But I realized that the topic was more academic than was uh, going to be covered in, in those few words or whatever it is I was expecting. So in a sense... um. He came up with something I wasn't expecting. The wording of what he came up with was something I was not expecting. And I believe it's because, I personally believe it's because he is an academic and no one can take that away from him. Of course not. He speaks an academic language. Now, in the work that we do, we deal with academics, it's true. But we can't always speak in academic language 
with detractors, with detractors who are likely to take that language and make it into a victory for themselves. So putting it in another way, you can put it this way. You can say that there's a way to speak, okay, to people who are enemies of yours. And which is watertight, which prevents things being snipped out and used against us. Me and you might be more co comfortable dealing with people like that, like, or speaking on these issues because we know the nature of sound bites, we know the nature of cut and paste, we know the nature of um, manipulation, narrative mm -hmm. manipulation. Yes, Qadi, that's not been his area of expertise. Sure. No, of course not. And therefore, you know, it's, we can't really expect from him to deal with, uh, with these issues like a master polemic, where, to be fair, even people who are master polemics fall into these issues them, him themselves. Of course. But back to you, you don't regret asking him that question. No, I do regret it. I do regret it. I shouldn't have asked him that question. But if that's only in hindsight. Like, I, what I regret, and this is, I think... What made you delete it? What made you delete that segment? The 30-minute segment. Yeah. Because, it, because people were using it for manipulated narratives. People were using it for manipulated narratives. What I did thereafter is I just took the whole thing down. I put it on private. Because people... It's like, for example, if someone were to say something, mm. okay, which could be construed as incitement to terrorism. Yeah. Even though the person themselves Didn't is, mean not, that by is not intending that. And say, for instance, someone ha can have the consequence of creating terrorism. I, would, I think it would be a moral duty for me to delete that, even though the person didn't mean that. Uh, so, so as to uh, to avoid the bad effects. So, uh, so, before we move on to the next example, are you then saying that the correlation of potentially giving ammunition not just to our enemies, but possibly misguiding Muslims from within? Possibly, yeah. The, the, the two things I think that I mean, Yasser Qadi himself, he he did mention that he didn't intend to say, or he, he could have said it in a better wording or of something course. like that. So, from those two perspectives, I think it was. Uh, the wise thing to do The right thing to do And obviously I was advised By uh, many people To do that as well And I thought that That was the middle ground approach But What I've learned from this Is not Oh you didn't ask the right question It's that I didn't do Enough of the right research Okay Like to be fair The the method of asking people What question should I ask Yasser Qadi Or whoever else it may be And then going ahead And asking that person, that question is not the best method. So, are you? But you, but you tend to do that on Twitter a bit as well, where you ask people who should who should I debate, who's more worthy of debate, yeah. and so forth. Is that something that you're going to move away from? Yeah, I think there is a place for it as well for consumer feedback and end user feedback. But um, there's also a time and a place for that. So it's all about appropriacy, I think. So moving on to one, another mm. a situation. That you found yourself in uh, about six months ago or so. Um, it was a, a, a string of tweets pertaining to uh, Sheikh Al Bani's, Rahimahullah, his position with regards to, please correct me if I'm wrong uh, immediately because I don't want to misrepresent the Sheikh, uh, was his position, if I'm correct, about breastfeeding and, and the relationship of a mahram and a non mahram. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, and Many from within the Salafi community, even those who don't necessarily fall within what we would regard as the madakhila or, or so forth, let's put them aside. There were others who did not fall within that camp that weren't entirely pleased with the, the, the decorum of that exchange and, and, and those mm. tweets. And then obviously there were certain things that you said to certain brothers uh, of that thinking. Um, yeah. Was it truly... To do with medication, or was it again? No, you no. This issue, I was. Well, there was a message that I was trying to to put forward, and it was a message that I I believe maybe the you could argue both ways. You could argue that it was exactly the right kind of example, a shocking example, an example which would have the effect of making people think. So, what was the point you were trying to make? The point I was trying to make was, do not blindly. Follow. I'm not saying do not blindly follow scholars. Will stop because I believe you can blindly follow scholars. I believe that if you if uh, scholars who if, you, are, if you subscribe to a madhab, yes. Yeah, no, if, if you're a muqallid ammi, yes. Yeah, if muqallid as a muqallid of a school of thought, 
you can, you're you me, you're a lay person, you can follow blindly, for, 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 no problem. I'm not blaming anyone. But uh, just, just, just for, for the yeah. viewers and listeners, yeah, yeah. wouldn't it even be highly recommended for Muqallid Ammi to... Yeah, yeah, that's the only way forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what I'm saying is this, let me, let me just break this down in the way that I know how to, okay? I think, think of Islamic law like British law for a second, okay? We were talking about this before the, uh, before the podcast. You've got two aspects of British law. You've got law. Mm. You can either have constitutional law or statute law. Yep. Or whatever other kind of law. And then you have precedent or what they call case law. Okay. So you've got two types of law. You've got the piece of legislation, law itself. Black and white. And then you have how judges have treated and understood this. Those laws. Yes. Islam is the same. It has the piece of legislation, which is Quran and Sunnah. Okay. And obviously, uh, Ijma and Qiyas. Ijma and Qiyas. And more, by the way, there's, according to a Tufi, there's like 11. But those so are Shara man, qabla, Shara man qabla na, al ihsan istishab, uh, um, sorry, uh, what do you call it? Maslaha mursala, maslaha mulha, maslaha. But, but let's the, stick the to four, the four major yeah. ones. You have the legislation, and then you have how ulama across time have seen this law. Now, if you went to a British court, you would be prepared to do both of those things together. You'd be prepared, you'd be expected to not only just bring the law, but how people have, uh, or judge, uh, or have or interpreted like, or ruled yeah. in the law, specific so in, laws. Islamically speaking, we do the same exact thing. We get this ruling, and we look at how it's been judged uh, across 1,400 years. If you bring something new, that's not there in 1,400 years of scholarship, that is abandoned. Now you're creating your own precedent, you see? Okay. What, what we're saying is, from the Islamic perspective, you have to have both of those elements. So it's not good enough to say I'm following Quran and Sunnah. We're saying it's not good enough. You have to say we are following Quran and Sunnah. Be fahmi, whoever it is, this alim, this according is the to precedent, this scholar, according according to this, the mufti, yes. this is the mm. precedent. If you have both of those things, you, you, you are legitimized in following an opinion. Now that opinion... As Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, it has to be followed by ta'ifatun min al-ulama. It has to be a group of scholars. So it can become mu'atabar opinion. It can become a legitimized opinion. It's not just one person who has said it and actually everyone else has disagreed. 99% of people have disagreed. And we can bring examples of that. So let's talk about the ruling of Sheikh Albani's that you mentioned. So the, the, to be fair to Sheikh Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, Sheikh Albani is not saying any man can go and suck any woman. And I think that uh, breasts... Okay, and I think that it came across like that in my tweets, and obviously this is my point of mistake. If you look at all of his fatawa together, he's saying a man that is brought up, or a person, a boy or something, that's brought up in uh, foster mother or sponsor mothers, whatever you want to call her, mm-hmm. even though adoption is not, that, that language is not allowed in Islam, in that household, if he has grown up, just like Salim Mawla grew up, that he's allowed to drink from her breast directly from the halam and blah 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 from the nipple and all that kind of thing and then he he uses terms like because it is uh, black and gloomy and some of dark and gloomy or whatever uh, now my point is is that really this kind of language and this kind of specificity and that kind of detail was not mentioned before by scholars mm. and that's why following albani or bin baz or ibn Uthaymeen mm. is not enough Especially not if what they're saying opposes 1,400 years of scholarship. The, 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 the counter-argument was... So that not, was the point you were trying to make. Yes. The counter-argument was it's not opposing 1,400 years of scholarship. Ibn, uh, Ibn Hazm said something similar. But I already had mentioned that Ibn Hazm has, <laughs> was another notable exception of someone who did oppose the ijma, right? Uh, and so that's all it is at the end of the day. It's fine. You can say this is an anomalous opinion, which means it's not something which is standard, and I follow it, blah, blah, blah. But just exp- don't expect the whole ummah to be on your side, because the whole precedent doesn't show that. So what I was trying to show to people was, you can't bully people, and this is the whole, you can't bully people with what Albani said. Because just because Albani said it, it doesn't make it true. It's a very simple, straightforward thing, but for people who are grossly infatuated with Albani's fiqh, it's a big... It's a big um, Blow to them, I believe. Mm. It was shocking for them. 
you know, Albani rahimahullah, he wrote a book called Sifat Salat al Nabi, which is like the wasf or the description of the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed. Okay, I'll ask a question. Hasn't this done been done before? It's been done before, right? Of course. Huge scholars, much bigger than Albani, have done of course. a better job than Albani and more, better than he will ever do. And more comprehensive. Yeah, because they are way bigger ulama of the madhahib and so on. Of course. Now, if, if someone who is Salafi, especially in fiqh, takes this book of Albani, Sifu Salat al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then he's, Albani is arguing from Hadith perspective, and then they take this book and they see their Hanafi parent or their Hanbali or Shafi'i or Maliki parent praying in a different way to that which is described in the book. They're going to use those hadiths and try and attack their parents. Now, this not, has happened. This, this happens because this. It's, it's, it's called fiqh tarjih mm. where the hadith speaks and they'll say, well, have, I have a hadith, you don't have a hadith. In other words, what they're saying is, I believe in this argument and you have another argument. But they don't understand, right? They're doing as much... Blind following as, as their parents are doing But they don't even realise that they're doing blind following Because they, they see the evidence but underneath They don't realise that whatever their parents are doing Also has evidence Are you essentially saying that they are also making taqlid To some degree Of course they are uh, They are making taqlid But the, the problem is they have the delusion Of thinking that they are uh, they they've, have, they've researched it themselves yes. or it's, or it's, or it's a, but, but Because It's argued in a way That oh I have this is the evidence And so all the other evidence is false and so they'll go to their parents and say, this is the evidence. I have a hadith. You don't have a hadith. And that's it. But they do also have a hadith. Of course they do. And or they're looking at the same hadith in a different way. So all I'm saying is the same thing as Ibn Taymiyyah said is, Raf al-Malam. He literally named his book that. L- lifting up the blame for those people, for those scholars who have looked at the evidence in a different way. To each their own. The, these evidences have to be tolerated. This difference of opinion has to be tolerated. I want people to realize that following this kind of fiqh from Islam QA or Ibn Baz or Ibn Athaymeen or Albani, that what they are following is an opinion of many opinions. They're not following Islam is not muhtasar fi haula. It's not it's not some summarized and compre- comprehensively summarized in those scholars. If they understand that, they'll understand that the deen is much wider than they think it is, especially from a fiqh perspective. If they don't understand it, they will be they will narrow themselves. Wallahi, and they, because in the English language, if you want to find something else, you're going to go to Islam QA. It's high up on the elixir rank. People think that is the only access to information. And they think that is what Islam is. No, this is really the opinion of the Mutawasatim, of the Hanabila, for example. And it's taken on by someone like Ibn Athamin, who is a Munajid, has taken it as an opinion. But if they realize that this is one of many opinions in the deen, it can save people's iman. It, it make people realize that there's much more diversity of opinion in religion of Islam, and it's it's better generally. It's better generally for the Muslim people to know that, and it will create more humility, intellectual and um, jurisprudential humility for the people. So why couldn't you concisely articulate in a thread of tweets what you've just done here now? Yes, uh, I think that was uh, what is Twitter is something which exposes my weaknesses. Which is why I decided to kind of leave it for, for, for the time being until I manage it. Um, yeah, tw- Twitter is something that because there's no editorial process, there isn't on YouTube either. No, it, w- before I put something up on YouTube, I look at it. Okay. Or at least some someone. Looks oh, at tweet! It. You're talking about the instantaneous nature of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just okay. straightforward. And all it takes is two minutes, and someone has already taken a picture of it. It's it's as good for me as WhatsApp. Okay. It's actually, it's, it's more alluring than WhatsApp. So um, what then resulted in you taking it down? Am I not taking it down, basically uh, taking a breather from Twitter? It was good. Good for my mental health, good for my physical health. It was good for my time as well. Were you genuinely going through issues or was that just a cop-out? No, I was going through issues. I had some physical injuries at okay. that time. I had, I had, uh, I'm still going through of my back injuries and stuff like that. I'm still trying to strengthen up my back and... Uh, and other things, but you know, what kind uh, of dr- what kind of drugs were you on? I was on tramadol. Tramadol is there was a time where I couldn't sta- I couldn't move my I couldn't sit up, mm. so I could just move my head. So you're saying that the medication that you were on at the time was somehow linked to? I think it was. Yeah, it yeah? just made it more made it more impulsive and stuff like made me more wor- worse. But to be fair, I'd probably be quite impulsive anyway without it. So 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 let's just stick on this that that kind of. Twitter meltdown, is that fair? 
I think that's the language of the uh, disbelievers. That's what the kind of language they use. Okay, okay. Uh, they use uh, the word meltdown. Okay, the the, the Twitter it's episode. What it is? The Mel- Twitter episode. Yeah, episode is more neutral language. More neutral language, yeah. Was meltdown a bit too kind of uncomfortable? No, I think it was uh, loaded. That's the whole nature of it. Pardon? That was the whole point of it. <laughs> if it wasn't a meltdown, then why would you then link it back to health and medication and so forth? No, I think it was. You know, it was. It was a time because a meltdown um, implies a steady deterioration, right? Oh, we know that's not happening. Alhamdulillah. Well, I think it was more tumultuous and volatile. Okay, fair enough. In that case, then would you would you say you gave your detractors or those who were trying to convey that message to an underarm point? Yes. I think that's what it is. Like, the, the, it's a distraction when when my detractors talk about my behavior rather than my arguments. Mm. And the, and the fact that they can do that now gives gives their followers a, a chance to clutch at straws, straws. and th- them and their followers a chance to clutch at straws, an even more severe chance. Because before, what can they talk about, right? If if it isn't my behavior, if my temperament, all those things they don't like. I haven't heard people sitting there talk about the contingency argument mm-hmm. for two hours or an hour and a half and talk about how it's wrong or. Um, the, my view on X, Y, Z Or why this is wrong Like the actual academic information Is not there this, They'll spend maybe 50% of the time Speaking about my behaviour If not more Which is a long time To speak about someone's behaviour Who is your teacher? Or teachers? I have many different teachers Am I allowed to Are we allowed to know any of them? Yeah I have uh, You know I will publish this one day Okay. I will publish one day. I'll publish it, but but for now, you're not going to mention a single. I one. have to speak to them about if, if they want to, if their names to be mentioned. In, do you in do you, do, you, do you consult them before you you embark in certain engagements? No. So, do you consult anyone before? Yeah, we do. I, I, <coughs> my teachers, a lot of them uh, are abroad. Some of them are in this country, but they are quite busy. Um, it's usually those individuals who. It's usually those individuals who. Um, uh, kind of like know the Tao a little bit and are mm-hmm. a bit senior than me in knowledge. Yeah, so that, I think you're talking about me here. Uh, <laughs> this guy. That, that helped me. Uh, like there, there are some brothers that are like, you know, some five, ten years older than me, like this kind of age group. They know about the Tao, they know about the culture. In, in many ways, they're, they're the pulse of the Tao okay. because, if it, you know, they'll, they'll direct it. But in terms of big fatal and stuff, this is for the Alama and stuff that we go to. Okay, hold on. Was anyone consulted? With regards to With Twitter you, No no hold on, hold on Listen yeah. listen Hear me, hear me, hear me first yeah. uh, let's, let's rewind it back to What was asked of Sheikh Yasser Qadi Did you feel the need to Maybe check in with anyone Whether this was a good idea To ask him that I did And what was the feedback you got I got some feedback Saying it was Yeah go and ask him this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah uh, The manner in which you engaged uh, Those who We would coin as the Madakhil Or that strain of thinking do you ever consult your teachers with regards to the manner in which you engage with them? Sometimes, yeah. No, some are not not for it. You know, some some are not for it. The whole thing, the whole idea of refutations against the madhalis. So why do you persist on it? Some some are for it. But you say overwhelmingly for it. I don't know if it's overwhelming or not, but it's, some are for it and some are against it. But I'm I'm for it. But let's 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 talk about a ve- a very recent episode yes. uh, involving uh, Nahim Ajmal. From yes. Bamga, most commonly known as uh, Mufti Abu Layth. Yes. Um, but a small segment uh, of a video he made in August 2020, a very short clip of which he said something along the lines of uh, the Pal- Palestinians should leave mm. and give Al Aqsa to the occupiers um, because no one's going to really come and help and liberate. So you might as well just leave and seek refuge and resettle in the Arab lands. Uh, you subsequently that, that 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 clip was doing the rounds. You did a video, a nine or twelve minute video, and um, within forty eight hours of that video, um, um, he was unfortunately his house was attacked yeah. uh, by a mob of individuals, yes. masked men. They smashed in his window, went into his house, called for him, and he was linked to do, linked to his position uh, on Philistine. Yes. Um, and then he came out and posted something on Facebook where he, whether he, whether this was his intention or not, he made a clear link between the video you made and the alleged misrepresentation of him 
that you did mm. and the attack that took place in his house um any regrets about that video well i i, I have a really well if i knew that this was going to happen i w obviously wouldn't put out that video um but i don't think i had any link whatsoever with that video i don't think what i said which is a refutation of him <laughs> caused uh, these people who are unknown to me, this mob, this violent people who don't know who I am, I don't know who they are, mm. to go and do what they did. You know, I, I think that the problem here is when we're talking about criminals doing criminal activity, okay, and then there's a deflection of responsibility or there is a scapegoat that's being used, which is me in this case. I think that's diabolical. Okay. I, I, I reject that in all What about in his all what, what about his second claim that you misrepresented his view that he has always been pro-Palestine, he has been critical of, of Israel, he's referred to it as a terrorist or, or had carried out state I, I, didn't, I didn't make any points against that. Okay. I didn't say that. I didn't say that he's, he didn't, he's not pro-Palestine in his understanding of it. Mm. I didn't say any of that. So rather, would you say then your video was specifically to that point of giving up Masjid yeah. al-Aqsa? Yeah, that's, that, this is what I was criticising him on. And I don't think he's, that is what he said. It's very clearly what he believes in. And do you think that you're going to just make refute, whatever you say, you're going to say whatever you want. And then there's no one going to come and correct you. So why is it okay for you to correct other people? You know, at the end of the day, he he allows all kinds of, uh, discussions to be made He talks about The church uh, The Christchurch killer And when he was making fun Oh the comedian Sorry who made, the comedian the, yes. comedian the Australian comedian yeah, Who made fun And when he came When he came out Abu Laith said uh, He believes that yeah, He's right to Humor, humor is yeah. sacred mm. We're talking about the death Of like 50 people Cold blood in a masjid And you're saying You, you, you take that as Really sacred and important mm. But when your house was uh, raided and stuff And you made your little video You weren't smiling You weren't laughing You weren't doing any of those things mm. And so I believe that You know At the end of the day um, If we're if we're being completely honest About these things Just in the same way As you expect people To be very serious about What's happened to you And your family Which is disgusting And diabolical And condemnable And wrong Quite frankly And monstrous haram. And completely haram And of against Islam And something we, You know We are against Of course And criminal just as you expect us to be very serious on those matters about your daughter's suffering, why can't you be serious and your wife or your partner's suffering? Why can't you be serious okay, about the death of 50 people? Why don't you take that seriously? You know, do you not know, and this is the case, we know this for a fact, that the, the victims, the families of the victims of the Christchurch attack were very angered. Some of them, we know for sure. Very about this comedy, this this comedian that came out. And did it. So why do you not? Why do you not respect those people's wishes? Mm. Why do you expect everyone to just? Care? Is this very? Uh, it's a different kind of narcissism. It's, just, it's, a, it's it's a very odd kind of narcissism. It's like when it's you, everyone has to be very you know serious and talking about. And moreover, and this is something that was said in the comments, and I think there's a, a degree of truth in this. You are telling people to leave. Um, because they're under attack So why don't you And take your family And leave as well Birmingham Unless but Because if, if the, the whole illa If you want to put it In an Islamic sense Right mm. The illa is That Darar Okay Or it's uh, Causing harm And therefore they should leave Do hijrah Or leave the place Yeah Which is the same thing as Not not, not the same But another sheikh said this I'm not yeah. going to mention him Right Famous sheikh If, if that's the illa doesn't that apply to you as well? Because now you've been under attack one time. How do you know it's not going to happen again? How do you know that because of your views, which are completely anti-Islam, you will not continually be uh, you putting your family at risk by being in that place? So wouldn't your own reasoning be used against you here? Bro, these are all valid points that you're making. Um, and, and, and most, if not all of which I agree with. But I guess the specific point I'm asking is that he would argue yes. um, is that you misrepresented his views. How? Uh, because that that thirty second soundbite of telling the Palestinians to leave Mosul Al Aqsa, give it to the Zionists, and to relocate, and, yes. and, and it, in the Arab lands, was taken from a twelve minute video. So what is uh, that? Is that not his view? Is, um, is that is, is that not his view? Yeah, of course that's his, his view. view? He, no, it's his view. So, so what's the problem? The, the problem is that the proximity of the time, according to him, the misrepresentation plus no, but it's not misrepresentation if it's representing exactly what he believes. 
he's confusing misrepresentation with mentioning every single one of his views on a topic. Misrepresentation is when I distort the meanings of something. That X becomes Y and Y becomes Z. I'm not doing that. He said that his view is that those people should leave East Jerusalem, Masjid Al-Aqsa, or whatever it may be, any parts of West Bank, or I don't know what areas he's talking about in particular, maybe even Gaza, mm. I don't know, and go to other Arab lands. Okay? If that's his view, then I have not misrepresented it, unless he's saying that's not his view, or that he's abrogated that view, or that he has a different view. So I have not misrepresented that view. If Unless what you're telling me is that he's changed his view, or that, that he didn't say that in the first place. Oh, he definitely said it. Okay, so that so um, that I'm not misrepresenting it. It's, I'm maybe not adding the fact that he also he also happens to call Israel a terrorist state. Look, so that's nothing to do with that. Look, bring 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 bringing the podcast to a close, right? I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question very candidly, mm. Hijab. Um, you find yourself in in these undesirable pickles at times. Mm. Is this something that's intentional? Or is it something that you can definitely have more control over? Because one of the questions I asked you back in 2019 on episode 2 of the Barbara's podcast is that where do you see yourself in the future? Do you see yourself as a polished, pristine, academic debater and intellect, intellectual? Or do you still see yourself as a YouTube preacher and someone who frequents speakers' corner? And, the, and that will a situation come where you'll have to choose one over the two? And I found that most of the dramas take place in the former Speaker's Corner What's happening, whether it be the very recent trip to Golders Green Or the dramas with Abu Layth Or asking Yasser Qadi a question Or the to and fro between yourself and the Madakhila That's not happening as hijab, the prospective, aspiring, soon-to-be, glistening, academic and intellect and debater It usually happens in the other half of the work that you do is this something that you can have more control over? I, I do believe I can have more control over it, and definitely there's more to be done in that area. But there is a hadith, من, uh, من أذاهم, you know, the ones who mix with the people, the Prophet said, the one who mixes with the people and he's patient with their uh, other, literally meaning the, the punishment that they can inflict or the fitna that they can have or the affliction you can get from them, is, is, more, is higher in rank than the one who doesn't, basically. And I don't believe it's the way of this, the, 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 the prophets To just stay in an ivory tower somewhere And write journals And that's you, definitely not going to happen. You said the exact same thing to me two years ago mm. But the point What I'm positing to you That you are not I don't one. think I mentioned this hadith two years ago Did I? No, no, not, not in that detail yeah, yeah. Not in that detail But you did mention the point about You don't believe that it to be the prophetic way Or that of the way of any of the prophets Yes to be in ivory towers And disconnected from the awam mm. But the point I'm trying to make to you is that why is it that you find yourselves in this in these situations where you've made a video, a refutation video of Abu Layth, two days later someone goes and smashes up his yard? No, but that's, that's and, and I'm, 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 yeah. I'm just I'm just saying how it can be perceived. Yeah. How it can be perceived. Yeah. Uh, where you find yourself asking y- Yasser Qadi a question, then Yani within forty eight hours, seventy two hours, that snippet's been taken out. Or you know, where you've had to put a clarification tweet up about your health and your mental health and the medication. Is this something which moving forward, inshallah, Allah gives you a long life, my dear brother. I mean, but with the weeks and months and years to come in the life of hijab, is this something we're going to see more control over? Or are we are we expecting more? If you're going to get in the shower, you're going to get wet. Okay. No. <laughs> you know, I can't. I, I can't. <laughs> 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 if you're gonna get this shot, you're gonna get wet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're getting in the shower, yeah? And it's just part of getting wet, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is mm. I'm sure if you were to, you already said to me that if you knew how the situation was going to pan out with Yasser Qadi, you wouldn't have asked him that question. Yes. You already said to me that as a result of your mental health, your physical health, as well as I, your I call, I call all of this collateral damage. Okay. Okay. Now, one has to think the question, the question is the output is quite, quite a lot. Okay. If, if you want to have a lot of output, be, pre- be prepared. You're saying you're going to get it wrong somewhere here and there. Look, if this is the general rule, 
for human beings. Okay. If you want to do, if you want to do a lot of things, be prepared to get a lot of things wrong. Mm. I can't tell you that. You know, two years from now, I'm going to say to you, look, the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And two years after, I'm going to because the truth is, all I'm trying to do is minimize my mistakes. And that's where it comes back to the question of being managed. Yeah. Do you understand? But do you know what? We've Would, got good leadership at Sapiens. Okay. Uh, Hamza Zulz is a fantastic leader. You know, he's. Um, He's managed Ayura very well. He's made it go, I don't know how, how many, 100%, uh, 1,000% or whatever it is. Uh, his but he, stats but, and numbers. Okay, okay, but so not only that, he knows how to deal with me. He knows how to do, He knows how to show respect and also get it back. He's got a very, you know, very strong managerial approach. And he's very he does indeed high, high level emotional intelligence. So I believe with someone like him as the leader of the organization, it will be, it will be fine. Uh, and that's a fantastic soundbite in defense and support of our brother Hamza. But he also posted a status a couple of days ago about Dawa individualism. Yes. Is that something that you find yourself falling into at times? I have a lot of, I've, we've got a system here. You know, I've, we've got Brother Zisha and we've got Ali Dawa. We've got, you know, some brothers that are behind the scenes that don't want to be in front. Uh, that also help. We've got Hamza Zorsis. And whenever we do something, there's always feedback. Now, the, the question really is... What about consultation before the stuff? That's the problem. Not every, not every time. To be honest with you, that we can't always do that, and because sometimes things are immediate and they require immediate attention. Shura only works for things that are planned. Okay, so consultation only works for for things that are definitely not spontaneous. Maybe spontaneous. how long do you need for Shura, bro? No, I mean, like if you go in the street right now and you see someone engaging in a fight or something, that's different. Like that, or some woman being raped. You know, you're not going to do Shura before you. Okay, have to how much how, how much time from the moment you decided? Yourself, Zishan and, and Ali as, a, as an anecdotal example how, how much time did you have from the point That you were going to visit Golders Green On Sabbath day To when you actually did it What was the duration, the time period then that you Did you consult anyone? We talked about it together And we did realise, we, we saw pros and cons and we, we did think that there might have been A, 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 a You know, a blow, what, was it, what do you call it? A blowback a Blowback or backlash, right? But we took the risk and and quite frankly, we don't care about the, you know what what these uh, Jewish newspapers, uh, uh, which are actually not even Jewish newspapers, they they claim to be Jewish, but they're actually Zion, pro Zionist newspapers. If you look at who's writing them, because at the end of the day, you know, if we we will be disabled from doing anything if we care too much about what people think. So, wrapping up, mm. you're not making no commitment on camera today, of any shape or form or in the remotest sense. Yeah. That there will be some level of conscientious reining in of certain uh, styles of engagement because you might get it wrong. No, no, no. I have a output of a hundred. You might get it wrong twice. Is that basically what you're saying? If I uh, depends on how wrong I get it. Like you know, you know, and uh, um, I can't tell you. I can't see and tell you that I'm not going to make mistakes. Okay. Uh, if I went into a boxing ring, I can't tell you that I'm not going to get hit. I prefer the shower one. You like the show on that? can I say? But all I can say is, all I can say is this. All I can say is I will try and remain as principled as possible. Inshallah. Sticking on the Islamic principles, taking advice. You will see retractions from me in the future. And if you don't, that's a sign of insincerity. One thing that the Madhalis, they never, like very rarely ever do, you know, is retractions. And that's one of my clearest evidences that they're, on the wrong path um, I am going to offer retractions I am going to make mistakes I am going to come back uh, And try and amend them I'm still young And uh, um, Have you hit 30 yet? 29? Yeah, yeah So You know I There's a reason why In the Nubuwa starts at 40 By the way And you know It's interesting Because even Aristotle said That if you want to start Being a leader You should start at 35 you shouldn't lead a country before 35. And also, if interestingly enough, in the American Constitution, mm. you can't be a president unless you're 35 years old. You know, and there's a reason for that. But the, the point I'm making is that you can't be... The reason is, You know, the Quran says that when he reached his prime and he reached 40 years old. So asking me as a, you know, not even 30-year-old to do the actions and behaviors of someone who's... 40 and above I think I will not be able to meet that promise and especially when Mo Moses alayhi salam in the Quran says you know 
آتيناه فلما بلغ أو شده آتيناه حكما وعلما when he reached his prime we gave him حكمة wisdom and mm. علما and knowledge. knowledge and we know a should is 40 years old so I am not going to be given that if Moses wasn't given it at 40 I'm not going to be given it at 29 one very last question before we close and have the uh So you're going to see a lot more mistakes. <laughs> Basically, um, do you see your, do you regard yourself to be a Salafi? Whatever this may mean to many people. It means many things to many people. No, it means many things to many people. So if, if we're talking about uh, someone who follows the Salaf and they're pristine and goes back to the Sahaba, then this is Sunni Islam. This okay. is not only Sunni yeah, Islam. That's, this is Islam. Yeah. And so of course I, I subscribe to this. But if you're talking about a group The people. movement, the Salafi movement. What does that mean? The Salafi movement is something which is intrinsically and undeniably linked to first and foremost the Saudi state. Okay, fine. Then it's, 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 it's religious, uh, it's clerics, yeah. um, and, 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 a, and, a, and a version of Islam, whether it is a, some would call it, unfortunately, some would call it a perversion, some would call it a distortion, some would say progression to Athari Hanbali way of thinking. So I do. Consider myself an Athari. Mm. I consider myself a Hanbali in fiqh mm. and a Hanbali in usul and in furwa, basically, in, in a sense, Hanbali. In the sense that I would look at the what Ibn Qudama says. The, some Hanbalis nowadays they just look at what you know the the later Hanabila said, and they look at Al Ghaya and the Liqna and uh, three books really, which is sorry Al Ghaya. And Liqna and Muntaha, Muntaha Iradat. And they kind of say Hanbalism is, is those three things. I don't subscribe to that either. I think that's making tight what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made wide. Mm. So, Hanbali method for me, it starts with Ahmed and it ends with those, what you call Muta'akhirin. Mm. So, I would look at that. I would look at those books. I haven't gone through all of those books. Someone like Al Hajjawi wrote something like Zad al Mustakhna, which I have gone through and still going through actually. You know, um, So having said that, I would usually like my behaviors, the way I pray, the do, way I fast. Do, 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 do you take do you take from Muhammad Abdul Wahab? No, at all. At all. Anything. Nothing. Why? I believe, and some, many people would uh, maybe beg to differ with this, um, but I believe that Muhammad Abdul Wahab was a Hanbali. I believe he was a Hanbali, but he he wasn't, <laughs> yani he wasn't a marja in the Hanbali madhab. Which means for our viewers, he wasn't he wasn't a reference. Simple as that. He's not a reference. He's not. He's not even seen as a scholar of the madhab. He's not seen as authoritative in the least. So there's no need for me to go to his fatawa on fiqhi masail, especially. Uh, What about creedal matters? No, there's no need for that. He's not. He's not an expert uh, logician or an expert. Uh, Um, I would prefer to see the works of Ibn Taymiyyah. If, I, if you wanted to see what the authorities have to say on something, you go to Ibn Taymiyyah. You know, especially if you're, if you're dealing with philosophical matters. Mm. And you might, I, it's, quite frankly, I don't even agree with Ibn Taymiyyah on everything. There's some things which when you go into detail, you realize that's Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have a, it doesn't go back to the Salaf. Mm. And, and this is high level stuff. M many people will not understand it. Like if I start speaking about Hulul Hawadith or, um, Uh, uh, something called Hulul Hawadith. Tra gonna, translate. Not, uh, it's very difficult to translate. Just translate what you said there, Nibra. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying to give a whole commentary. So it's, it's the concept of, it's, 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 it's basically the concept of, put it this way, the immutability of God. Okay. Is God immutable in all aspects? And if, if, so, if so, does that mean that he cannot, for example, his will, does God's will change it? We, be, we believe it does will, it change. Mm -hmm. But what about the 30 characteristics, the essential and intrinsic characteristics, do they change? Another, so he has, Ibn Taymiyyah believes in certain things on that mas'ala, which are controversial. But uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi mentioned who, who is his polemic. Uh, he said to him, no, no school of thought has left out Khul Hawadith. Every school of thought has something, mm. problem with this issue. Even the Ash'ari school of thought. And he's obviously speaking on that behalf. But that's just going into detail. The point is, as I'm saying that, what you, Aqidah is not something you, you look at and you, um, you, you copy like that. You, you, I try and make my, do my research. And even if Ibn Taymiyyah says something, I'll... Yani, he's just a scholar like any other scholar from that perspective. Like, you know, for example, Hawadith La Awla Laha. He believes in Hawadith La Awla Laha, which, by the way, I, you know, Hawadith La Awla Laha is a, very, is a very unique opinion to Ibn Taymiyyah, in my opinion, which is basically a tasalsul. Like, he believed that God created something before something before something, and he kept doing that pre eternally. 
Okay, now I have I have a quote from the Salaf. I have a quote from Omar ibn Khattab mm. saying that the first thing that create was created was X. Mm. I have a quote from the Salaf saying that the first thing that was created was whatever it was, the Qalam or the, and so on. So that seems to run counter to what Ibn Taymiyyah believed in. Uh, the point is Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't have to be right about everything in Aqidah. And what I'm saying, and I'm giving these examples, and once again, someone's going to write PDF, write a thousand PDFs, it doesn't matter, I don't give a damn. You know, everyone's going to have their opinions about this. But, um, you know, and certain uh, phraseology that he would use, I don't necessarily agree. Do you believe, we're wrapping up now, yeah. and, and whilst it's not necessarily fair to get a yay or nay from you, mm. but to a certain degree, do you feel that those who subscribe to describe themselves upon the, the manhaj of the salaf or as salafiya and so forth, <laughs> Do you feel like they've done a disservice to the Athari creed? And I, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think that they're, they're too much of, if there's too many people that describe themselves in that language to be generalized. That's what I believe. I believe that, you know, we can't generalize. The Madakhila. There you go, I've been specific now. Even they can't be generalized. You know, even within them, there's, there's intellectuals and people that are like, maybe not intellectuals, but individuals who no no individuals who can who, who possess higher knowledge than others okay. like you can't compare abu khadija to abu ayad abu khadija is an, a complete ignoramus but he has a bit of charisma that's why he's the leader whereas abu ayad is much more intelligent than him and much more academic like it, there's no there's no comparison it's like comparing a year 9 to a third year you know BA. university student yeah it's like that so, but having said that you know um what was I asking? What was the question you asked? The question I was asking is that do you feel that they've done a disservice to the Athari creed, the classical Athari creed, the normative Athari creed in Hanbali fiqh? In, in Asma' wa Sifat, they're not actually that off in, in the in the bab of Asma' wa Sifat from the Athari perspective. They just have particular perspectives and they can be dogmatic about some of them. But they're not, in Asma' wa Sifat, they're not completely like saying something ridiculous. It's fi bab tabdiya, ahkam wa Sifat, that Calling people deviant upon yeah, yeah. those things. It's about it's about their intolerance. Okay, that's the problem. Hijab is an absolute pleasure, my brother. Mm. khair. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing what the weeks and months and years have in store for you, my dear brother. Um, obviously, we do need to have the the arm wrestle. Uh, I believe you done me nine seconds last time. I thought it was eleven. It's nine or eleven. No, it was eleven. So let me let me try and beat that time. No, you just jumped for the longer time. Yeah. Okay. Where are we doing it? Where are we doing it, Zishan? You can't have an no, arm no, wrestle no. on the floor. Get, get, it has yeah. to be here. It will be very quickly. Okay, yeah. I'll do it in five. Seconds. Don't, don't, don't talk about it like that. Five. No, three. Three. Yeah. All right, three, two, one, go. Nah, wait a second. Nah, one oh. second, bro. Nah, wait, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Sisters, just for tuning in. <laughs> subscribe, <laughs> subscribe. Oh, you feel me? Okay. Subscribe to the oh. Five Pillars YouTube channel. Leave a comment, uh, like, okay, share, subscribe, subscribe, and until next time, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Blood Brothers Podcast, Five Pillars Production. <laughs>